Okay, we have about 30 people or more, and it's 2 o'clock. So to be mindful of everybody's uh, time, I think we should get going. Let me see if everybody's here. Bogey is here. Okay, so um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. This uh, session will be recorded or is being recorded because a lot of people are currently doing other activities for Israel today. So and express interest to watch this on a later time. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining. And the panelists here, myself, Nama, Keren, Daniel, and thank you very much for Jason uh, Holtzman from the JCRC, who is hosting this. And we're really honored to have, it says Moshe, but he goes by Bogi Yalon. Bogi Yalon, I don't think that he needs much introductions. Most of the people here know who he is. He is a person, first and foremost, a person that has dedicated not only his career, but his entire life to protect and defend and save and promote Israel to what it is right now. And, you know, it's a, it's really a huge honor to have Bogey here on this call. I'll start with that. You know, he's been uh, in the army pretty much commanding many of the most elite combat units throughout. And then gradually he climbed up the ranks and became the chief of staff of the IDF. He was, I think, the 17th chief of staff of the IDF. And after that, after he was, you know, he contributed so much of his time and his life and efforts in the army and the IDF, he moved into politics. And he served as a politician in several parties, including the Likud and Kaholavan, which, you know, Kaholavan is the party now of uh, Gantz. And he has been doing so much including serving as the Minister of Defense in Israel for about three years, between 2013 and 16. He has done other stuff, amazing stuff in his life. And, you know, he has written numerous articles and books about what's happening in Israel and uh, what he thinks are the challenges we have in the Middle East and in the whole world. And it's really a privilege to have him here. So we wanted to talk to Bogi today as just to hear his opinion about what is happening in Israel in the last year, and of course, since this war has started since October 7th. So, Bogi, welcome. Thank you, Yair. Uh, shalom to everybody. I'm glad for this opportunity uh, to share my views regarding the current uh, situation in Israel and the challenges ahead of us. I'm not so keen to speak uh, in English about our dirty laundry, and I don't do it in any foreign uh, media. Uh, I used to do to fight for the case for Israel, for our legitimacy, because of my experience, but I can't make it since the inauguration of this government uh, last January. Uh, and that's what I want to share is Jewish communities all over the world, as we mishpuche, we are mishpuche. I believe that uh, we have to share even our dirty laundry here in Israel with Jews all over the world. Now, uh, if I have just a minute to try to explain what is the main challenge of the state of Israel today, it is very easy to, to say it, it is not well understood for those who are not involved in our internal issues. And when I talked about existential threat for the state of Israel, usually I spoke about Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and other uh, uh, organizations in the region claiming to wipe Israel off the map of the earth. Nowadays, the main existential threat for Israel is internal one, is from within. So Israel now is in a crossroads in two aspects. Whether to keep the way of Jewish democratic liberal state according to the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, there's the founders of Zionism, Sin Herzl, of course, Ben Gurion, Jabotinsky, and others were the founders of this way of Jewish democratic uh, state, or to become a theocracy, messianic, fascist, racist, 
homophobic, corrupt, and uh, not welcomed among the democratic nations all over the world. That's one aspect. I claim that this government, government without declaring it before the elections, is going in the second way. And I will explain it. The second aspect in which we have to make the decision is whether to keep separation between us and the Arabs who live in the land of Israel, namely the Palestinians, or to take over, to occupy Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Judah and Samaria, to transfer the Arabs, to include the Israeli Arabs, to transfer them and to have a Jewish state without Arabs, according to the messianic way, which the spiritual leader, the rabbi of it, is Rabbi Dov Leo. I'm not sure that every Jew know him, but the most influential figure today in Israel, influencing and dominating this government is Rabbi Dov Leo. Who is Rabbi Dov Leo? Rabbi Dov Leo was the rabbi of the Jewish underground of the 80s, intending to blow up buses with hundreds of Arab casualties in East Jerusalem. This underground, Jewish underground of the 80s, intended to blow up one of the mosques in the Temple Mount. What is the idea? Is to encourage the Messiah to come by initiating what they call Gog and Magog war, by blowing up one of the mosques in the Temple Mount. His way was to generate a war with all Muslims, with all the Arabs around us, in order to wipe them from the land of Israel, to keep the promised land, the promised land clean, clean, clean with, without Arabs. It is beyond imagination. You might say, I can't believe it. This is the case. And we were fortunate at that time that Shabak, the ISA, foiled their intention. But later on, his follower, Dr. Baruch Goldstein, murdered 29 prayers in the tomb of patriarchs in Hebron in order to try to ignite this fire. Gog and Magog war. It failed, but since then we started to absorb homicide bombing attacks, suicide bombing attacks. So it wasn't the Gog and Magog war, but he succeeded in igniting the fire. It was after the Oslo Agreement, 94. Uh, and then one of the great successes of this followers of uh, Rabbi Dov Leo was assassination of late Prime Minister Rabin. That was a success. Again, immediately after the assassination, in a discussion among rabbis, he was blamed for giving the religious order, what we call in Hebrew, Din or Death, which allowed the Galamir, the murderer, of Rabin, who met Rabbi Dov Leo before, prior to the assassination, to do it, to execute it. Unfortunately, two of his followers are very dominant in our government today. Bezalel Smutich, leading what is called the Religious Zionist Party, and Itamar Bengvir, the leader of uh, Jewish strength, what Smayu did in Hebrew. Itamar Bengvi was a follower of Rabbi Kahana, 
which was outlawed at that time in Israel. And when he, were allow he was allowed to be part of the political system, Yitzhak Shamir, late Yitzhak Shamir, as the leader of the Likud, when Rabbi Kahana addressed the Knesset, all the Likud members went out from the hall. Unfortunately, Netanyahu allowed both Itamar ben and the Talis Mutrich to become a dominant members of his government. Smutrich was arrested before the implementation of this engagement plan by the Israeli police because of Shabbat information that he intended to detonate car with 700 liters of gasoline on the way between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in order to prevent the implementation of this engagement plan. He was interrogated for about a couple of weeks. He kept si silence. He didn't cooperate with the interrogators. But Smutrich is a follower of Rabbi Dov Leo. He wrote an article, he published an article in 2017 in Ashiloach, one of our magazines, regarding the decisive victory on the Arabs. I urge any Jew to read it. The idea is, first of all, to encourage the Arabs to leave the land of Israel. Those who will refuse to make it will force them to do it. And if some of them want to stay in the land of Israel, they should serve as a minority. Uh, but they should obey, they will have and will enjoy civil rights. They will be our servants. This is the idea. Benvir was indicted eight times in the Israeli courts. One of them was to supporting terror and other uh, indictments. Now he is in charge of the Israeli police. And Bessal Smutrich is in charge of our treasury, the Minister of Finance, as well as responsible for the Israeli activities in Judea and Samaria. It was not the case in the elections campaign of uh, Netanyahu. Actually, he was not ready even to have any photograph with Ben Gvir as an example before the elections. Now there are two dominant ministers in our government. In the elections campaign, Netanyahu didn't mention that he intended to have what we call judicial reform, and we called it a regime change, a regime of revolution in the state of Israel. And when on the beginning of January, his justice minister, Yariv Levin, delivered a speech claiming to have such a revolution, he called it reform, hundreds of Israelis went out to the streets representing more than hundreds of thousands of Israelis trying to keep the DNA of the Jewish state, Jewish democratic liberal state, according to the Declaration of Independence. That was the case in which the protesters, I was among them, succeeding in halting the reform, the revolution, uh, instead of uh, having what we call the Hungarian blitz in the way of legislation that they tried to do, they tried to move to have it in a Polish way, gradually, but actually they were stopped for a while. This government hasn't give up the idea 
of the judicial reform or the revolution as we call it. Nevertheless, in the last year, since January, this government started to provoke, especially Bengal and Smotrich, provocations against the Arabs. Provocation, provocations meaning the first week after the inauguration of the government, Bengal went to the Temple Mount, challenging the status quo. And Smotrich was talking about eroding Hawara after 40 houses in Hawara were burned by Jews, Israeli settlers. Palestinians were attacked during this period of time. And according to what we have found in Hanunes, in the tunnels, the documents of the Hamas leadership discussions in the last year, Yechia Sinwar, the murderer, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, said, if we Hamas as resistance uh, movement against the occupation, as they call it, are not able to defend Al-Aqsa, Temple Mount, in front of Bengvir provocations, and we're not able to, to, uh, to uh, defend our brothers in Judea and Samaria, the Palestinians, we are useless. And actually the decision to initiate the 7th of October offensive against the Western Negev was a result of those provocations. You might claim, and I agree, that uh, the Arabs refused to accept the Jewish entity, the Jewish state, since the 19th century. And as a defense minister, not talking about as an officer, I fought terror by many ways. But to have such provocations on behalf of the Israeli government, actually encouraging Hamas to go to such an offensive. He knew, Yechia Sinwar, that after such an offensive, the Gaza Strip will pay a very significant price, and this is the case today. But he was ready to go to these steps, actually sacrifice, believing that he did. He didn't have a choice but to initiate this offensive against us. Nevertheless, when I'm talking about the dominant elements, the messianic elements in this government, without going to too many details regarding the failures of the military at the beginning, on the, before the 7th and on the 7th of October, the failure of the intelligence, and they are responsible for the failures. The main problem with this government was the provocations in one hand and the new concept to myself. I served as a defense minister until uh, May 2016 under Prime Minister Netanyahu. I didn't hear from him in any point that Hamas is an asset and the Palestinian Authority is liability. Actually, Netanyahu adopted the Smotrich and Bengal way, claiming that Hamas is an asset and uh, the problem is with the Palestinian Authority. Why? Because if the Palestinian Authority exists, we have to have any settlement with them, negotiations or whatever. Hamas, no one is expecting us to negotiate with them, on top of it, the United States. So Hamas is an S. More than that, it came out to the public. Netanyahu decided to find support Hamas financially. Cash money from Qatar, $30 million every month in order to get silence, protection. And with this money, no doubt, Hamas succeeded in arming itself, digging and uh, 
constructing the huge tunnels under the Gaza soil, which our soldiers have to deal with it now. So if we talk about the current situation in which we had, we didn't have a choice after 7th of October to go from the defense to the offense and to charge with Hamas with very heavy price, we have a problem. These dominant elements, messianic elements in this government, they do not allow Netanyahu to release the hostages. They are ready to sacrifice them. They stay for the Messiah coming. They are ready to sacrifice them. This is my word for the Messiah coming. But this is the interpretation of what they say. We have to fight them to the end of the day. Total victory. What does it mean? And if we have to sacrifice the hostages, we sacrifice them. The second problem that they don't allow Netanyahu to decide in the Israeli cabinet what will be the end state of this uh, military operation. I was the chief of general staff. To go to any military operation without understanding, deciding what will be on the day after, what we call it the strategic objective or the end state of the operation, they are not ready. Why? I think that we are fortunate to have the United States with us. From the very beginning, President Biden understood very clearly the situation. And on the first week, he proposed the end state of the operation. He came after 10 days. On the 17th of October, he participated in our cabinet meeting, unbelievable. Unprecedented, the president of the United States sitting in the Israeli cabinet, proposing his plan. It wasn't a new plan. Before the 7th of October, he came with the idea of creating the axis of moderates in the Middle East to include the United States, Israel, the Arab countries who share with us peace accords to include the Abraham Accords countries in the Gulf, the North African countries. And the good news is to have Saudi Arabia part of it, agreeing to normalization with the state of Israel. Immediately after the 7th of October, we changed all the cards in the game. He came again, saying this is American interest. To is this axis? Again, the axis of the bad guys. Iran cooperating with Russia, not just in the Middle East, in Ukraine as well. Of course, Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen, Hamas. The Shia militias in Iraq and in Syria, all those are part of, parties of the, the axis of the bad guys, and to push out Chinese economic influence from the Middle East. But in order to make it, he said, I need someone to manage the civil affairs in the Gaza Strip. Now, it's not Hamas, and he said, I agree. I don't want Hamas to rule the Gaza Strip, and you, Israel, you will be allowed to pursue them, to fight them to the end of the day. Even after the war, to have the freedom of operation, like we enjoy now in, the, in Judea and Samaria. Just to have, have the comparison of Judea and Samaria and Gaza, I led the troops in defensive shield operation. 2002. It took us a few weeks, four weeks, to have the divisional deployment and to fight the terrorists, but it wasn't the end of the, of the war. Actually, as the chief of general staff, it took me two years, I call it, to cut the weeds, 
of terror, of Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, to stabilize situations regarding the threat of suicide bombing attacks. And uh, Biden said, you will be able to make it with Hamas to the end of the day. But someone has to rule the Gaza Strip. Now, if you, Israel, don't want to rule the Gaza Strip, to spend your money on reconstruction, recovery of the Gaza Strip, you should allow a local committee to make it a local committee, namely Palestinian committee. And I will bring the Saudi Arabia and the other countries to finance $50 billion to recover reconstruction and so forth. But you should allow it. Abu Mazen agrees to make it with a, what is he called revitalized Palestinian Authority. And I have many reservations regarding Palestinian Authority. The administration took responsibility to make it. It is very ambitious. But Smutich and Begir says, we want to rule the Gaza Strip. To have a military governor, to run the civil affairs. We want to take over the Gaza Strip to occupy all the Gaza Strip, to transfer the Arabs, and to settle it with Jews. You know, it is unbelievable to make such a strategic mistake. But the way of Netanyahu is not to make any decision, this way or that way. So after five months, 156 days, in which we fight, even today, of course. Our soldiers, unfortunately, we lose soldiers. Yesterday, officer, a major, today, a sergeant, without agreeing about what will be the end state. Why? On those two topics, release the hostages. Agreeing about the end state of this war, Smutich and Begvir threatening him. If you will go the way that we don't agree with, you will lose your coalition. So it's very simple. Netanyahu prefers his political survivability, personal survivability, rather than to make decisions according to what I believe are the Israeli interests. Okay, I wanted so, to hold up for one second. Yeah, I wanted now. to direct a phone call, the conversation, a question that comes up again and again. What is, you know, what people are asking is that you started this conversation by saying that the greatest existential threat to the state of Israel is this current government. And I will be the devil's advocate because what I hear and what we hear on WhatsApp groups from Israel, from the United States, etc., is that how can this be true? We have Iran, we're you know, on the verge of a, a nuclear weapon, and the Hezbollah, and of course the Hamas. And it's not only the Hamas. Many people are saying that the Hamas in Gaza was elected by the majority, the vast majority of the Palestinians. How can you have peace with people who did barbaric animals that you know, committed these atrocities of October 7th? They will do it again if they have the, the, the chance. So with all of these enemies, and especially what happened on October 7th, is really the Messianic Jews are the greatest existential threat? Because what we hear again and again is maybe, I mean, I hear it, and I'm sure all of us hear it, maybe somehow they're even a little bit of right about the true desire of the Arabs to, to come and be able to have peace with us. We have the external threats. I dealt with it in all my capacities. I fought Hamas. I fought Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Iranian elements, Hezbollah. But in order to be able to fight them, first of all, we should agree that Israel should be a Jewish democratic state according to the Declaration of Independence. And we should make our mind whether we are going to occupy again Gaza to transfer the Arabs from Gaza, then from Judea and Samaria, 
and the Israeli Arab. This is the idea of Rabbi Dov Lior and his followers in this government. We have to make our mind. Now, I claim that 80% of the Israelis prefer to keep the state of Israel as Jewish democratic liberal state according to the Declaration of Independence and not to occupy again Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Street and to transfer the house. We have to make our mind. Otherwise, we will be able to fight neither Hamas nor Hezbollah, not talking about Iran. So those external threats now are in the second priority to my mind. First of all, we have to make our mind in order to be unified and to be, as they call, a secured, prosperous, just, moral state. This is not the case so far. That's why I can't justify the activities of this government. If 40 houses in Hawara were burned by Jews, I can't justify it. I can't justify the Jews fired, burned a family in Duma, parents with the baby. I can't justify it. As I can't justify the assassination of late Mr. Rabin or the murder of the Muslims in the uh, Tomb of Patriarch. And if we go this way, with Smutrich Bengvir, without making clear decisions, this is not our way, we'll be able to fight Iran, Hamas, or Hezbollah. This is my point. And that's why I claim that this is crossroad. We have to make our mind eternally which way we choose. And now one, neither Smutrich nor Bengvir, can, can teach me what to do with the enemies. You know, I had a case as a defense minister in Hebron in which a soldier killed a neutralized terrorist who still was, was alive. But he was neutralized, for sure. And he decided to shoot him in his head from five meters, hello Azaria. And he said immediately to his friend, who was beside him, who asked him, what did you do? There was the risk for our life. Why did you shoot him in his head? And the answer of Elor Azaria was, anyone who comes to attack us should be killed. You decided to execute him? It is not according to our values. Neither as Jews, nor as Israeli soldiers. It is against the law. Unfortunately, in this case, he was embraced as hero by politicians. And in the Knesset, I had to say, I'm sorry, but I, in my, during my lifetime, in the military, there is no one here in the Knesset who saw or met enemy soldiers or terrorists. And I had to kill them. No one of them, you. You don't understand what is the war in which we should win. We keep our values, moral values. And if we allow Bankville to lead to mobs calling death for the Arabs, I commanded Israeli Arab soldiers, Bedouins, Christians, Muslims, not talking about the Druze soldiers. How can I look to their eyes? I can I look to Israeli Arab doctor in Rambam who saved the life of one of our special forces unit commander who was injured in Jenin. He was treated by him in Rambam hospital in Haifa. And he hears the voices outside from the mobs of Bankville. This to the Arabs. This is not the Jewish way in which I believe that we should make our mind and lead the country to a very different way, according to what was our way, to include the Likud way. Whether Jabotinsky, Menachem Begin, Shamir, that was the way to keep our moral values, to win, to fight, to win, but to keep our moral values. What I claim that there is no chance in the current political situation with this government 
to overcome the challenges. Neither of Gaza, nor in Lebanon, not talking about releasing the hostages. They don't intend to release them. They are ready to sacrifice them. And in order to have a change in which will represent what I believe 80% of the Jews in the, the Israelis, let's just say, mainly the Jews in Israel, we should go to elections as soon as possible to allow this government actually has been abducted by those dominant fascist racist elements to go the current way. It's very dangerous to our country. It might be an existential threat if we go to the destruction of the first temple, the second temple, quite remind me of the same situation. Extremists who led the Jewish people to destruction. This is the case. I'm optimistic because when I participated in the protest with the protesters against the, the attention to have this uh, revolution regarding the judicial system, which will not allow us to keep our democracy, so many Israelis went to the streets because of the DNA. Now they are confused because we are in a time of war. This is not the time to demonstrate. There is awakening regarding the people who understand what is at stake now. And I believe that the vast majority of Israelis, referring the way of Jewish democratic liberal state according to the Declaration of Independence, rather than becoming a theocracy, a fascist, fascist racist, uh, not welcome, neither in Washington, nor in London, but first of all, not welcome by myself. My first examination regarding our activities is to look to the mirror. And I don't feel like today that the Israeli government is representing my values, the vast majority of Israelis' values. Bogi, this Thank has been so amazing. Let me, I'd like to introduce uh, my close friends from the area of Philadelphia, Danielle, Karen, and Nama, who's actually in Israel, just had a, her second grandchild a few days ago. So I'd like to start with uh, Danielle, uh, maybe a couple of comments and uh, questions from the audience. Yes, uh, thank you for these very important things that you were saying. Um, I agree with you on the existential threat to Israel that is internal and not external right now. Um, I'd like to take uh, a few questions and merge them together, and they're also very much my own question as well. Um, how should is it the right time already? Because we have in our community, we are very much parted on should we restart our protests and how do we do that in a way that shows that we're not against Israel, but actually for the Israeli people and for the country of Israel. So is it the right time to, to restart our protest movement? And if so, what would be the most effective way in which we could push for elections in Israel and for the removal of Netanyahu from office? I heard the... President Biden's statement in his interview of, in the MSNBC today, he put it very right, and this is my recommendation, to distinguish between the Israelis, the people of Israel, and this government. That's what he did. He embraced the Israeli people, but he criticized quite in a harsh way Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I believe this is the right way for Jews all over the world to support Israel, the people of Israel, but not the policy of the government. Karen? Thank you, Boogie, for your uh, great comments and words. I'm also in agreement with you. Um, I have a question from Hal Bar-Levy. What is your opinion of Israel's settlement activity? Israel has been accused of implementing a policy of apartheid. Given that Israeli settlers have freedom of movement, but Palestinians do not, 
is the accusation of apartheid leveled against Israel a fair accusation? And if so, would that be a threat to Israel's existence? I urge you to read my book. It was translated to English. I call it the longer, shorter path. Uh, I decided to go to politics because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because of my personal experience. I was the commander of the Judea and Samaria division until months before Oslo, August 93. And on 95, I was nominated to become the head of the intelligence of late Mr. Rabin in the peak of Oslo, Paris as a prime minister for a couple of months, and then Netanyahu after the election of 96. And then I became OC of Central Command, dealing with the Israeli Palestinian, the Palestinians in the, the West Bank and Jordan Valley. And then the deputy chief of staff uh, at the beginning of uh, the, the, what, what I call the deliberate attack of Arafat of September 2000 as his response to Barak proposal in Camp David and the defensive shield operation. I started as the deputy chief of staff and after a couple of weeks, I became the chief of staff. So I am very familiar with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I, I don't have illusions. I don't see a final settlement to the horizon. First of all, because of them, neither Arafat nor Abu Mazen were ready to, to accept Israel. To say, yes, we agree that the Jewish people will have a Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. This is the case. Nevertheless, I call for separation. As uh, Ben Gurion decided not to occupy the West Bank and Gaza in 1948, Levi Eshkol uh, said about the territories after the Six Day War as a deposit for the peace process. And even Menachem Begin talked about autonomy. Uh, Rabin called it a political entity less than a state. He didn't say even Persian state, but let's leave it alone, the, what will be the uh, definition of the Persian entity. I support separation to allow them political independence, which they enjoy since the Oslo Accord, to have the parliament, government, uh, chairman or whatever. They might call themselves the Palestinian empire, I care less. It's not really a state. Why? Because according to Oslo, we have common economies. It, we can't go in a different way. The currency is a shekel. They, they are dependent on our water supply, electricity. They are not really independent. We have the overall responsibility for security. They should have armies, they have police and so forth, but keeping the separation. I don't agree with Smutrich way to settle every, every hill, even without government decision. According to our legislation, any new settlement should be approved by the government. But if we should keep the separation, territorial separation, and I believed when I was defense minister that we can make it even without uprooting a single Jew or a single Arab in order to reach any kind of territorial settlement. Nowadays, it's very difficult because Smutrich is doing whatever he can without government decision to settle every hill, every hill, illegal settlements. So at the end of the day, we should agree about the territory. Rabbi said about the territory in, in Judea and Samaria, there was a discussion about Gaza. It was clear that it will be their part. Nevertheless, he said, we are not going to move back to the 67 lines. He was the chief of general staff in the Six Day War. He understood that those borders, boundaries, were very tempted to attack us. And he said, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, we will impose our sovereignty on the settlement 
in Judea and Samaria, and ironically he said, uh, we should have a cluster of settlements like Gush Katif, which was Labour Party uh, 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 activities, the settlements, and uh, the, the uh, Jordan Valley, in the broadest interpretation of the term Jordan Valley, according to Igal Alon, a uh, uh, plan should be us, it will be our eastern border. And again, the settlement in Jordan Valley uh, Labor Party settlement and Jerusalem will stay unified forever to include Givat Zev and Vale Adomim. I'm ready to sign it now. But Smutich believes that the Arabs shouldn't stay in Judea and Samaria. And I don't agree with it. And you know, Dovlio, which I meant, whom I mentioned earlier, five weeks ago, they celebrated the victory uh, ceremony in Binyan Oma in, in, in Jerusalem. And he delivered a speech talking about the promised land settled by Jews without Arabs. What is the promised land? From the Euphrates River to the river of Egypt, whether it be the Nile or El Arish Vadi. Can we afford it? Even morally, from the moral point of view, to transfer the Arab from this piece of land? What is the idea? So I claim that we should go ahead in, the, in, in, in enhancing the separation between us and the Palestinians without illusions, without reaching final settlement in the coming future, but not to rule them in the way that Mutrich wants at the end to get rid of them. Bogi, I have a question that came from both the chat and WhatsApp. That is, I'm gonna emphasize what Danielle was asking before. We, the four panelists here are Israeli American and we work with tons of Jewish American and Israeli starting the war that has been, it's as the community here has woken up and it's so amazing to see all the things that people are doing. But there's also, it's a very diverse community. Orthodox, modern Orthodox, conservative, secular reform, you know, right wing, left wing, people who are die hard Democratic, die hard Republicans. Why is this message that you're telling us crosses the boundaries? And it's not only relevant to the left wing Democrats or this or that. Why is it relevant to all the Jews, wherever they are? And what do you think that we should be doing, the American Jews? Because, you know, we hear a lot, oh, we can't say anything about, against the government of Israel. It will raise anti-Semitism or sheket yorim. We can't talk or criticize anybody during the time of war, things of that sort. So my question again is, or the, people, the people's question is, your message is relevant to everybody and what can we do from abroad? You know uh, the story about two Jews, three synagogues. This is the case. Nevertheless, the dispute today, it's not about right or left. When I call for separation between us and the Palestinians, according to our interest, I'm considered hawkish. Yes, I'm hawkish. When it comes to defense, I'm hawkish. But in this case of separation, I agree even with peace now. I believe that they are mistaken. Be believing that we will give peace of land and we will reach peace now. So I, I am very critical for them. But in this domain, we are together. That's why I claim it might be 80% 80, 80 of the Israelis, Israelis to create the new coalition without the fascist without Mutsuch and Bengbe, without Arabs who do not agree, do not recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, to exclude Mansour Abbas. He says, I agree, this is a Jewish state. I want to live in the Jewish state to enjoy my civil rights. He might be part of the coalition. So the, the separation is not right or left. It's really those who believe in Jewish democratic liberal state or a theocratic messianic fascist state. And regarding the Palestinian issue, as I said, those who agree separation or occupying and transferring the Arabs 
this is there are two the two options. And again, I'm sure eighty percent of the Israelis, Jews and Arabs, will accept this way and not the second way. So I believe that those who claim check at your rim, we should silence. This is not the time to to deal with this. Really? Netanyahu deals with politics from the first day, from the 7th of March. You know, I heard about the uh, Hamas offensive in the Western Negev when I was in my kibbutz in the Arava Valley. And I started to drive to the north, as we call it. Even before reaching Mitzpah Ramon, I heard in the Israeli radio that a senior politician said that the problem is with the chief of general staff, the head of the ISA, starting to blame them. You are not responsible. You are not accountable. He decided to deal with it from the very beginning with politics. In not taking responsibility. So this is a time because it is even too late to realize that this government is not able to lead the country to any victory. Not talking about total victory. What does it mean total victory? Yeah, this is the opportunity now to destroy Iran, to destroy Lebanon, to destroy everything. What is a total victory? His interest is not to end the war. You understand that after ending the war, he will have to explain a couple of explanations, which he, he doesn't have. So again, because of political considerations, political survivability, we are not able to lead the country to get out from this crisis. This is the time to go out, to speak clear and loud about what is the problem. What is the challenge? Danielle, you're on mute. Um, really? Now you're fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question that I'm also interested as, uh, in. Uh, being from the North with lots of uh, family and friends there, could you share your views and predictions regarding the situation on the northern border, the prospect of war, and the ability of citizens to return to their homes along that border? I'm not sure that the idea to evacuate the people in the north was the right idea. It was a, a decision based on panic. Because what was had happened in the Western Negev, the decision was made without second thought. Nevertheless, this is the case now. It's a pity. Actually, almost 200,000 Israelis are not at the, their homes, neither in the Western Negev nor in the North. Nevertheless, when I thought about how to conclude this crisis, first of all, I believe that what uh, is called the American proposal, the US proposal, should have been adopted by Israel, saying yes, but those are our conditions. About the freedom of sailing in the Red Sea, about the Shia militias in Syria, about the nuclear project in Iran, and of course about Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now, there are two representatives of, on behalf of the Western world in Lebanon. One is a representative of the US administration, Mr. Hochstein, and a French representative with his influence on the Lebanese government. I still believe that we can reach any kind of understanding about Hezbollah deployment far away from the border. Now, I'm not naive. In any case, any understanding in the Middle East should be backed by big stick. That was my way as defense minister, as the chief of general staff or whatever. If someone is threatening us, or violating any understanding or agreement, then you have to use a stick. And 
while doing it, you should find a way to have any kind of arrangement, settlement, as we did. I was behind the Abraham Accord before being published as Abraham Accords. I had the relationship and the discussions with the leaders in the Gulf. And I am a strong believer of relationship consists of interest, not illusions, not dreams, not even contacts written by lawyers. Interest. And I believe that we can reach it in the North. Now, what Hezbollah is saying today? First of all, they decided not to go for a full-scale war because they understand that we might, they might absorb such a destruction in Lebanon. They want to avoid it. On the other hand, when we had the ceasefire for a while, the truth, as we call it, when we released the children and the women for about eight days, they seized the fire without any understanding. And they claim, we will go on in this uh, attrition war in the North as long as you fight in the Gaza Strip. So part of any conclusion of the crisis should be silence in the North and to reach any kind of understanding of pushing them away from the border to allow our people to go back to the kibbutzim, moshavim, kiryat shmona, metula, and so forth. Nevertheless, the IDF should be available to those settlements and towns to defend them in a very clear way that no one will think about any, any attack, any offensive against the people of the North. That should be the case in the Western Negev as well. Um, I have another question. Um, aside from Smotrich and Ben Gvir, why aren't there five or six members of Likud who have the courage to put their country ahead of their political careers and decide to vote Oops. and decide to vote against this government that we currently have um, and bring down the coalition. Uh, I'm referring to the existence of five to six people who, when they did their military service, put their own lives on the line. Why are there not brave coalition members who actually have the power to save their country? Do they really not exist? It's a very good question. You know, I resigned from the government in 2016 after having some clashes with Netanyahu regarding corruption and other issues. Nevertheless, let's leave it alone. Uh, I believe that the in Likud party, and even not just in Likud party, in the coalition, there are members of the Knesset who do not sleep well at night. But as long as Benny Gantz and Gadi Eisenkot and his party, Mechanem Amlachti, are still part of the coalition, there is no chance that none of them will make a decision. Today, the, the coalition is, is more than 70. You need more than five in order to go to elections. I believe that if, and I hope it will happen, Gantz and Eisenkot and his friends from the Machane Mablachti will decide to leave the coalition. It will be easier to have more than five members of the coalition voting for elections. Okay. I have a, oh, oh, sorry. Daniel. Oh, sorry, Daniel. I have a bit of a challenging question. Um, as far as we know, with the information we have, uh, the October 7th attack was planned for longer than a year. How is that in line with what you were mentioning about the attacks in Hawara? How did how did those attacks make a difference in the in the attack? Very good question, but not so challenging. Uh, the idea of uh, having a plan to attack uh, the Western Negev 
was initiated by Yihya Senoir and his friends in 2014. I was a chief, I was the defense minister at that time. The idea was to go out from the tunnels at the time uh, and to attack the kibbutzim up to the road. That was the scale of the offensive. Now, my mission as defense minister was to foil the idea of offensive tunnels. And we succeeded. We found a way to identify the tunnels. We didn't have the technology at the beginning, but we succeeded in acquiring the capabilities to identify the tunnels and, of course, to destruct it, as we did in the north, finding six tunnels uh, constructed by Hezbollah, crossing the border, of course. I'm not talking about tunnels in the Gaza Strip or tunnels in Lebanon, crossing the borders in order to use it for the offensive uh, missions. We succeeded in following their intentions by having such capabilities in which they understood that there is no way to surprise us by any attack coming for any offensive tunnel. We built a, quite a massive, sophisticated obstacle along the border with Gaza. We understood there is no way. Now, they prepared this offensive. They even modified it, using it from up the surface, not using the tunnels. We had the information about it. But the idea to do it in uh, the 7th of October became, re became re relevant because of the provocations of the government. It, be it began even before in what we call Shomer Chomot, the provocations of Bengvir on the Temple Mount. Later on, after the inauguration of the government, uh, the provocations of Bengvir on Temple Mount and the provocations of Smutich and his followers in Judea and Samaria. And they decided that this government is challenging them by those provocations. So he decided to launch the offensive. He called it the Great Project. On the 7th of October, I claimed with another government, he wouldn't have done it. So it was an excuse and a reason for him to launch the offensive. Okay, I think the, this is, uh, has been very interesting and we're at time. So I'd like to conclude with one more question, a comment, and also hope to hear from you a message of uh, optimism despite everything. I think that the criticism of what you just said from many Americans and, and Jews is that, you know, it doesn't really matter. They provoke, they provoked, but the Hamas or the Jihad, but mostly the Hamas, they're on a mission. They want to murder every Jew, child, kind of what you're, what you're talking about. And the question is, it's always a threat, you know, it's always a sword above our necks. And, um, but to go back to the question that many people have asked, so they understand, many of the people, we understand what you're saying about this government and that this government needs to go to have to, you know, replace to a more uh, moderate in the middle of the way government that can lead Israel out of this crisis. The message from many American Jews is that they are afraid to do so, or they're worried to do so, because if they, American Jews, Canadians, are basically overtly talking against the government in Israel, that can increase anti-Semitism within the United States. That's part of the concern. So what, what do you have to say about this? And then the last question is, what do we actually do? Okay, let's say that we decide. Should we put pressure on individual Chavrei Knesset, MKs, or go to our governors? What is the action that you call for from American or Canadian or, you know, global Jews? My recommendation, and, and no doubt this is a very complicated uh, situation. For me, it's very difficult not to justify the Israeli policy, but I can't justify. I believe that we are going the very wrong way. So we should tell us the truth. 
Yes, the people of Israel should be supported. As Biden said it this morning, in Israel it was morning. I'm not going to abandon the state of Israel. But this prime minister, he was very clear, talking about Netanyahu in his very life. But it's not just Netanyahu. This government is leading us to disaster, to destruction. So this distinction, which is very difficult, I understand, especially from abroad, even in Israel, supporting the people of Israel, supporting the state of Israel, but not supporting the policy of this government. I believe that uh, the way of Smutich and Ben Gvir is not the way of those who support democracy. Even Biden said it in the, during the the judicial reform. He said in the 46th words statement, if Israel will not keep the judicial system independent, it is not a democracy. And we are going to lose what we call the common values between us. You know, talking with Americans for years, every discussion we share common interests and common values. If we don't share common values, Israel will be like Saudi Arabia. In this case, we have interest, in the other case, we have no interest. Because the relationship between Israel and, and, and the United States, not just between the Jews and Israel, so deep because of common values. If you are going to lose the common values, it is disastrous for the state of Israel. So again, I believe that people should understand the state of Israel, of course, for us as Jews, but even for Americans, very important. I understand those relationship for us, United States in our national security is a cornerstone. But I believe the United States enjoys the fact that there is democracy in the Middle East, usually stabilized, sharing common values. If this is not the case, it will be harmful for us as a state of Israel and for uh, the United States as well. So I believe that this distinction could be very clear, especially for Jews, but not just for Jews, supporting the state of Israel, supporting the people of Israel, but not supporting this government. Bogi, but, I'm, but I'm optimist. So, I believe so in the power of the people. I believe in the power of the people of Israel. You know, those in the last year, I was very encouraged to meet many people deciding not to deal, not to be involved in politics, understanding that our DNA is going to be harmed, our democracy, our Jewish values. They went to the, street, the streets to protest and it was quite successful. I believe it will come again, and it will be successful because of the vast majority of Israelis believing in my, what I said as a way, keeping the Jewish state as Jewish, democratic, liberal, according to the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. That's why I'm optimistic. This has been amazing. And just uh, Danielle wanted to remind everybody that she wrote here, for those who want to be stay informed, you can join the WhatsApp group of the Philadelphia, the War Room. And thank you, everybody, and see the messages of Danielle above. Bogi, thank you so much for joining us, taking the time at your night. And thank you for all that you have done and been doing for Israel throughout your lifetime. You're unbelievably amazing. So, And thank you, everybody, for have joined us today on your Sunday. The... It's good to see you all, and let's uh, keep the message of optimism of Bogi. I just want to say Thank one you. last thing. Moshe, um, Eli Albansi is on the call, and he sends his dash. So he really Thank you. Dash Thank you. Dash me, man. Thank you. Thank you to all. Bye. 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 Bye.